Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Carrie Brower, Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. The Hirschhorn was endowed in the 1960s as a branch of the Smithsonian to give contemporary art and artists a national platform. Carrie came to the Hirschhorn in 2000 from the Museum of Modern Art in Oxford, England, and he has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Carrie, for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. So let's talk about the relevance of contemporary art in today's society. It is a society where the written word and the video image dominates. Talk about the importance of contemporary art as presented within museum settings and other settings. Well, you know, it's, um, it's very interesting, Mark. Um, all art was contemporary at one time. And uh, I think a contemporary art museum uh, differs uh, substantially from an encyclopedic uh, museum, even though many encyclopedic museums now have strong contemporary art components. But the difference is that we are dealing with the artists of our time. We are dealing primarily with living artists in a contemporary art museum. And these are individuals who are very much caught up uh, in the world today. And they're talking about the world today. And they're doing that through images, or they're doing it through installations, or even sound art, or over the last 10 or 20 years, uh, film, video, and digital technology. And they're making their statements about the world, about culture, about what they think is happening in the world today uh, through their art. So I don't think there's anything more important than giving these incredibly creative individuals a platform from which to speak about the world as they see it now. And doesn't, doesn't the art and, and the, the way the artists use materials, whether it's um, visual materials, sound materials, tactile materials, uh, words, uh, isn't, isn't the way that that is conveyed designed to connect to something that is not our normal process of communicating like we are. Yes, uh, one of the things that artists do, and have done throughout the ages, and but you can see it very much with modern and contemporary work, is the artist very often uh, wants to uh, make you take a step back. You see the work and something feels uncomfortable about it. Something feels not necessarily wrong, but not part of your normal day-to-day -day existence. That's when you have to make the decision as a viewer uh, to either turn it off and walk away, or you say, okay, this is rattling me. This is creating something, bringing something out in me that is not normally there, and it's making me think in new ways. And that's really the goal of, of real art, is, is to shake you up a little bit and make you look at the world differently. But that shaking you up can be both a uncomfortable and a joyful experience. It's, it's, uh, it can definitely be an uncomfortable experience. And I think this is where many people feel when they come to modern or contemporary art museums that somehow they're not getting the work. They walk into a room of, of uh, monochromatic painting and think somehow they're really not understanding it. When in fact they are understanding it. They're just shaken up a little bit about the fact that all imagery is gone uh, in the work and the work is about the very process of painting uh, itself. Uh, or they walk walk into a room of, of large-scale photographs now, much bigger than they're used to seeing in their newspapers or on the internet, uh, the size of paintings, if not larger, and it throws them off. Well, well, this should be a painting, but it's a photograph, and it's a photograph that now has a foot in, in the real, in, in the document. So how does, this, how does this correlate with what is usually fiction in painting? So it throws people. And that's a good thing, and the person has to accept the fact that uh, this has now given them a different kind of view and a new way of reading the world. And the, the artist himself or herself is taking a mass of information, a mass of experience, and compressing it down, giving it form, creating an object, a piece, a work, and in a sense, the person who is experiencing that is experiencing all that yes. in, in, a, in a second, yes. in a split second. It's, it, it's an incredible download of, of, of stuff. It is. Artists are incredibly good at thinking outside the box. 
And whereas most of the rest of us get stuck in our day-to-day -day routines or thinking within certain parameters and trying to tackle problems in the same way, uh, artists are able somehow through this sort of magic to jump outside the box and look at things from the outside. And they come up with absolutely new ways of uh, putting this information in front of us that they are seeing. And it's often in a very entertaining way, though that entertainment may not be comfortable all the time. It may not be necessarily a joyful experience, but it could be a, a, an experience that shakes you up just a little bit. And I think that artists are outsiders in a way. They can see things from a distance, and they can really see the truth in things very often, far more than we can. On the other hand, what's interesting about artists is you will rarely find one that will tell you what the work is about because they want you to figure out what it's about. And whatever it's about to you is correct. There's no wrong answer when you look at a work of art. So uh, you as a viewer are part of the work. And there's a, throughout the 20th century and now into the 21st century, there's been a big push among artists to collapse uh, the division between what art and life really is, so that it, they become blurred within their own work, within their own life, but yours as well. Uh, your life becomes part of the artwork. The experience of it is part of your life and part of the work itself. And isn't, isn't it that engagement, that refusal to be pigeonholed into just pretty stuff or... or yes. um, or, or nice and comfortable stuff or whatever, yes. isn't that the thing that, that is one of the distinguishing elements of, of contemporary art? It, it's definitely one of the distinguishing elements uh, uh, from the 20th century on. Uh, art is not comfortable, but even if you went back you know, several hundred years, you might find works that, in Goya, for example, mm -hmm. that were extremely uncomfortable yes. to the people who took a look at them. You're carrying on a tradition of artists uh, throwing you off balance in order to, for you to gain uh, a greater understanding and appreciation uh, of the world or of ideas that are floating around. One of the things that distinguishes <clears throat> the contemporary world today <clears throat> from even the contemporary world in the 60s and certainly the contemporary uh, world of the Renaissance and, and, and the Middle Ages and the earlier, earlier, earlier times is that while those uh, eras had their artists clusters where artists were very cognizant of what was going on amongst other artists, now people are so aware of what is going on in the world and the ability to connect with people over great distances and psychological um, uh, distances and, and experiential distances is, is afforded for the first time yes. and, and very recently over the last five and ten years and in an in, in increasing sense. How does that affect what you see at the Hirschhorn? That's a very, very good um, point. Um, Art has speeded up. It's, it's gotten extremely uh, uh, fast in the sense of the influences passed between artists and the knowledge that can be spread around the world, world very, very quickly. Um, where it used to take years for the influence of some artists to, to reach other artists over the last 10 or 20 years, it can be within minutes right. of them doing something. And, uh, but it, and you also see some rapid fire dialogue between it, these artists where you have short well, snippets of creation. Just Yes, absolutely. And in fact, I would actually go a step further and say that um, these interchanges are often becoming artworks themselves. Right. We have a show up right now at the Hirshhorn, uh, which is a retrospective of the uh, Chinese dissident artist Ai Weiwei. Uh, one of the things that he did in uh, the last few years was create a blog which was followed by hundreds of thousands of people. And on that blog he would post uh, uh, notices and he would post some of his writing, but he would also post photographs uh, that he was taking. And I think there's a, uh, a blurring between the objects that he makes to put in an exhibition and the actual internet activity that he was doing. The uh, Chinese government shut this blog down in 2009 because it was becoming so popular uh, that they became concerned uh, about it. Um, so it shows you the power 
that some of these the new media can actually have um, and the power that an artist can have in having a voice, having a platform through new media to express himself in a completely different way. Aren't all artists, in point of fact, dissidents? Yes, I, I would say that the majority of artists, probably the best artists, are in some way dissidents to some degree. They're always, in some manner, pushing against the envelope of either social issues, political issues, or at the very least, issues about art itself. How do you take art forward? How do you push against it? And the flip side of dissent is advocacy. So you're, you're advocating it, this isn't a negative. No. It's, it, it's a negative and a positive or a yin and a yang, a That's balancing it. out of forces That's it. that find this very powerful expression and creative expression and certainly much more pregnant than, than paragraphs and books of words. Yes. Um, and in an instant, you have an encyclopedia that sort of is available to the viewer to, to think about and to ruminate upon for, for, for the next years. Well, what, one of the things I always look for uh, in an artist, um, right or wrong, uh, it's one of the things that I do, is I look to see whether the artist is actually stretching art. Uh, are they trying to do something new? Are they building on the past and trying to take it on forward? An artist that's comfortably working within something that's already been developed can be a good artist, but not a great artist, I think. I think the really great artists are the ones that temp, the attempt, anyway, to take art to a new place. Because that, again, brings us back to the viewer. You can't really create a, an experience of meaning without making the viewer uh, perk up, uh, whether that's through experiencing something brand new, through being uncomfortable, through being hit with a social issue that they may have to think about twice. Well, you know, it's a very interesting point. One of the things that, that I see in, in uh, prominent um, artists is this idea of creating a concept and then templating it, repeating it, and, yes. and creating products that then can be sold yes. at, at an increasingly um, high price. Yes. Um, how do you... How do you take that point in relation to the point that, you're, that you were just mentioning, people who are pushing the envelope? Because once you've created something, to template it and then to recreate it several times so that it becomes of commercial value seems to fly in the face of, of what you're talking about. Yes, it does. It does in a way. Um, on the other hand, if certain artists have come up with one or two great ideas, um, uh, they very often repeat those ideas in, in variations. Uh, Cindy Sherman, you know, making herself up as other characters, you know, she continues to do that. And yet, she starts a new series every once in a while and has a variation on that theme. Uh, if you went to literature, I think Hemingway maybe had one or two great ideas uh, that really took things forward, but he managed to write them in different ways uh, uh, each time. Um, so I think the important thing is you find an artist who has this desire and this, uh, to have a new idea, to have a new approach to things. And then very often uh, you have to look then to see if they are able to carry that idea forward in a series of variations, maybe on the same theme, but each one seems fresh over the other. So, um, someone like Ed Ruscha, mm -hmm. uh, for example, has the idea of putting text uh, overlaid on top of, of imagery. He's been doing that since about 1962 or thereabouts. Uh, but each time he comes up with a new series, it seems fresh. And the whole idea of words, uh, language as a kind of landscape in his work uh, seems to bring out new things every time. So talk about the, the challenge as a, um, as, as a curator, um, as somebody who is shaping um, and selecting the, um, the shows at the Hirschhorn and uh, previously uh, in Oxford, um, how you pursue your craft to ensure that you're not just presenting nor ignoring mm -hmm. the prominent, not favoring the overlooked just to do that, but what is your 
uh, theme. How do you bring a focus to your work? Yes. Uh, it, it very much has to do with what institution you're at. And uh, uh, the fact that we are on the National Mall, that we are, uh, as the Hirshhorn, part of the Smithsonian, lends a kind of color, a kind of character to what I think we have to do here in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that I think uh, we have to do uh, might sound counterintuitive, but it's to not ignore controversial artists. It's actually to embrace the controversy, embrace the radical artists, and make sure they have a platform, a voice from which to, to speak. And to speak here in Washington, D.C. means more, perhaps, than speaking even in New York City, because this is a power center uh, of the world. And there are a lot of people here who can see the work um, that can change the world if they wanted to. So it's the dissonant voices here at the center of political power that, yeah, absolutely. Is, that is so important. Absolutely. I'm not saying we do every show that way, but I think there... That would be it, boring. That would be boring. But there, uh, we do shows once in a while in which we don't uh, uh, step back uh, or take a back seat to actual, you know, artists who are can be controversial. And I think that's important for the Hirshhorn to do. So I think where you're at and what museum you're working in dictates to you as a curator or a director what vision is correct for that institution. And the city itself also seeps into that and gives you a sense of, of what is right uh, for that particular place. For me personally, looking at um, uh, artists, uh, it's important uh, in our program to have a range of artists presented. Um, we do major retrospective of, uh, of artists, uh, both modern and contemporary. An Eve Klein show, for example, an artist that we felt though you might consider him a modern artist, earlier in the century was also pivotal in the creation of more contemporary work and very influential on contemporary artists that followed. Seemed like a, a good thing for us to do. And an artist that hadn't been seen too much or had a retrospective for a considerable amount of time. Uh, at the same time, we have a series called Black Box, which are emerging, fairly young, um, uh, uh, media artists, either film, I video, the, digital the, technology. I saw the Spanish. Uh, yes, uh, Democracia. Democracia. Uh, yeah, right. and uh, Democ Democracia is actually a uh, relatively political um, a group of artists working in Spain, uh, which bring new ideas, uh, you know, uh, uh, to uh, video uh, uh, now and shooting in, in high definition and. Actually, their day jobs are as cinematographers, so uh, really high quality uh, work, uh, but with a, a very social change uh, perspective to it. Um, and then we also have a series of direction shows, which are maybe artists more in the middle somewhere at the, you know, established to some degree. Um, but uh, deserve to have their first museum exhibition, or at the very least, their first museum exhibition here in Washington, D.C. What's interesting to me is, is that the Hirshhorn um, that ha has been around for a while, um, it is a museum of the, um, of the uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, of the contemporary, mm -hmm. of sometimes the, the very... Uh, prominent and sometimes of the, of the more obscure. Um, attendance doesn't happen by itself. No, no, uh, uh, we're, we're fortunate with, with our attendance, which is actually up this year despite the, uh, uh, the sort of uh, tough shows that we've had. I think, it's, I think one has to look at different ways of, of raising attendance. It can't be just from throwing big names onto the marquee. Um, it also has to be utilizing your spaces at the museum differently. This last year, for example, we uh, worked with uh, the Los Angeles artist Doug Aitken to do a 360 degree projection all the way around the facade of the Hirshhorn, which is, is made as a giant cinema screen. And it's just begging for something to be put on it. And so we finally got around to doing that. So and now the museum becomes the, the, the mall. The it's museum, basically the, the, it, it's turned inside out. And the, the joining streets are now becoming 
of the buildings can actually... That's correct. That's correct. So the museum is pulled inside out in a way. The images that should be on the inside of the building are on the outside of the building. Uh, it's open at night that way. And on the National Mall, which is usually fairly barren in, right. in the evenings, became a place of uh, a lot of excitement uh, at night with uh, thousands of people stopping Usually a by. couple of late night joggers and some strollers and that's people, it, right? And you're running across the work accidentally. Some right. people come to actually see it, others just wander and suddenly see this, this immense images moving on the outside of the museum and they become caught up in it that way. So you're getting an audience that wouldn't normally even maybe enter into the museum. Now what was the genesis for that idea? That was a complicated uh, uh, situation in which uh, we had actually approached Doug Aiken to take a look at a bookstore possibility of creating a bookstore for us. And when he got out of the car, uh, he looked up at the museum and he um, said, I have to do something on this museum. Well, for years and years, we've been thinking about having an artist project onto the museum. And when he said that, uh, we all knew. This was, this was something to actually pursue. The bookstore idea actually went to the wayside and ultimately Barbara Kruger wound up doing um, uh, uh, the bookstore and a new installation for us downstairs. And Doug uh, began work on this amazing projection. So you, you end up taking a, an idea that is uh, really dissonant with how one normally views the, the museum. Very much so, yes. And it's so unusual, none of the other institutions have done that. Yes. Um, and you have an artist who comes in and says, I'm going to do something, um, you know, maybe, maybe you'll get some negative press coverage, maybe it'll be positive, I don't know, but, it was a big but I risk. have to do this. It was a big risk because it was quite expensive, right. but we felt it would be something that would be exciting, especially for Washington where uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen very often. Um, and, and you make your museum into the canvas. And make the museum into the canvas. I think it's also one of the important things about contemporary art is that the museum can be a place not just to show work that's already been made, but it can be a producer. It can actually help the artist create new work. And in so doing, you feel like you're helping write art history that way um, and moving art uh, from today and into the future rather than just exploring the art uh, of the past. So that you have in, in one bundle there at the Hirshhorn, art on the inside that goes back to 1840 with Daumier to Doug Aiken presented on the outside that is really probably the art of the future in many ways. And, and you're, you're breaking so many other rules. This isn't an object. It's no. an idea. No, it's, it's the idea uh, that's given temporary form. Temporary form, that's but, right. But it's not given permanent form. So, so much about museums is about objects and object orientation and so yeah, on. Yeah, and I think we have to really move away from the idea that artists are going to uh, just make objects. They, they will continue to make objects, but um, the moving image medium has really allowed them to make works uh, that uh, are more temporal, that, that move, that can be put up and down, that can be projected all over the place. And not even on your building, but perhaps another building somewhere else or in some other space somewhere else or on the internet uh, being created for the actual, uh, your own uh, internet site. Um, linking up to other sites. So the museum, I think, the, the, the 21st century museum has to be a museum of expansion. It has to be a museum that extends outward from the inside out. And while I do believe very firmly in the sacred and contemplative spaces that need, that they need to be retained, uh, in museums. They're very important, but we also need to embrace this idea that art is changing and that artists are using different kinds of materials today. Well, Carrie Brower, this has been such a wonderful explana explanation and exploration of contemporary art today and of the work of the Hirshhorn, and uh, we're just really excited to see what you do next. The Iowa Wags uh, exhibition, which is on right now, is phenomenal. No, thank you. It is just astounding. Our congratulations uh, to you for it. And thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Uh, it was us. a pleasure being here. Thanks. Thank you, Carrie.